Aole e kau i ka pūrima E aha Baluna o ka pepa o ka e nevi E aha O o hui ai nga u ai e ma I ka pono si vila o ke ka nga tu Ah, eh, 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 eh. We just wanted to be able to go through a little bit of history. Not everybody knows this history of the evolution of Fed Rep and how we came to be where we are now with this nation building effort. We don't have a lot of time, so it's going to kind of be pretty short, not all the detail, but we just want to go over the basics. I just want to acknowledge that um, I'm a student here, so I had to juggle my homework with doing this. So any mistakes are, are purely my own, uh, any oversights, uh, all of them. And, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so we'll just get right into it. So it's, as you know, some of our values as a long way is mo'olelo, mo'opu'ala, understanding history through, uh, through our uh, Storytelling and, and connection, um, genealogical connection. So we're using this as a metaphor to guide us through um, this understanding of Daniel Kuni. So most of us know Apology Bill, Public Law 103-150. Um, 1993, President Clinton signs the bill where the United States apologizes to the people of Hawaii for their role in the uh, overthrow. Um, it affirms that Hawaiian people have never directly relinquished their, cra their claims to their inherent sovereignty as a people over their national lands and calls for reconciliation. This important point we want to point out that, that as we analyze the, the definitions and uh, so some of the political definitions of certain terms. This is where I believe we see already uh, a flaw, a failure in, in uh, our self-determination as a people. Yeah, when they drafted the bill apologizing, they acknowledged that we never directly relinquished our claims to our inherent sovereignty. And inherent might sound good on the surface. It sounds like inalienable. But it's not. Yeah? We understand how inherent sovereignty has been framed in the context of U.S. law. We see clearly that it's the uh, United States Indian law, yeah? inherent so yeah, sovereignty is really within the U.S. framework of tribal government. Yeah? A lot of our people, even some of our sovereignty people, don't know that. Um, so when they, when they apologize to us, they apologize that we never relinquish our right to be governed within the U.S. framework, basically. Yeah? So that's a problem. And then it calls for reconciliation. So they call for reconciliation, but as you see in their call, they've already set up the terms inherent sovereignty. They've already put the box around us as they call for reconciliation. It's very important. It says that, yeah, a good point. So, we didn't relinquish our claims over our national lands. That's important and, of course, we're all here because of that. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go through the whole Akaka bill years. Um, it's way too long and complex. But what we do need to know is that they tried for a very long time to force the Akaka bill on us, and many of us organized and worked together to fight federal recognition. They, they tried to force the Akaka bill on us with virtually no hearings, no free prior informed consent from our people. And ultimately, a Akaka bill fails in Congress, um, largely, I believe, because of U.S. racism, where we didn't, um, they didn't want to recognize us for anything. Um, so a Kaka bill fails, and what happens is there's this effort to try to get something else. So if we can't get federal recognition, let's try and start with state recognition, start smaller. But behind that process of state recognition, there's also an agenda, and we need to be real clear about that agenda. That agenda is that as some of our, our, our old-time activists know for many years, Office of Hawaiian Affairs
Cortez has made efforts to settle Sirenac claims. Oftentimes, most times, those efforts, all they failed. They could never settle the claims. The state would love to settle claims. And then one of the last ones that came out was a global settlement, which is across the board settled for everything. Um, and they were never able to do that. But what has happened is the Office of Hawaiian, of Hawaiian Affairs has come to a legal analysis, to a conclusion, that they cannot enter into a global settlement on ceded lands because they're a state agency. So they can't do it. But a native Hawaiian entity could, and it doesn't have to be federally recognized. A state recognized Hawaiian entity has the potential to enter into a global settlement. And so we believe that that's one of the underlying agendas. Not we believe, this is what we've been told from um, high level insiders. Yeah? Um, so they, Kaka Bill Fells, come out with Act 195. Many of us have, are not ready for Act 195. We don't know where it came from. And we're all caught off on guard, all caught off guard. We don't know. Who drafted Act 195? I think Sprinkwood Galuteria submitted it, but who was the brains behind it? Yeah? Uh, I know it was, I was, it was any, I don't know, I don't know anybody who was. So Act 195 creates the Night of um, which is a native role, and there is another problem, yeah? They start off without our free prior informed consent to create a native tribal role that you have to sign up to be a part of. I mean, the history of roles goes right back to Native Indian history, Indian law, yeah? And so it puts us in another box with this um, role. As I mentioned, no lawful consultation in the drafting, no community involvement. Um, key points of Act 195 is to recognize Native Hawaiians as the only indigenous Aboriginal population of Hawaii. And it reaffirms the state's desire to support the development of a reorganized Native Hawaiian government entity. And ultimately, pointing towards federal recognition of Native Hawaiians. The statement of recognitions. Sorry, the statement of recognition states that the Na Native white people are hereby recognized as the only indigenous Aboriginal Maori people of Hawaii. We already knew that. Uh, but what's interesting is basically the language reads that Act 195 already offers recognition on the state level. So when the entity is formed, recognition is already codified right here in this document. And if we understand that there's a potential to seek a global settlement, then it's all set up in advance yeah, for, the, for even a state entity. Of course, our friend, maybe not Governor Abercrombie, figures importantly into this because he appoints the Kanai Olavaro commissioners. Who appoints them? Not us. Yeah. They're self-nominated and they're appointed by the governor, not the Lahui, not the people who are going to be affected. Yeah? So it becomes very problematic for many of us. And, and then thus we see another layer of self-determination being infringed upon. We don't appoint the leadership. The, the agent of the illegal state appoints the leadership. Of course, shortly after, their job is to build a role this tribal role. One of the things they do is launch this series of public notices. <coughs> Native Hawaiians who choose to not be included in the role risk waiving their right and the right of their children and descendants to be legally politically acknowledged as Native Hawaiians and to participate in the nation. Basically, they're telling us if we don't get on the role, you're going to be excluded generationally, not just you, the kids and their kids and their kids. Yeah. As Kaleko said, is that all? Is that how we treat Ohana? So this really um, alienates, threatens, and um, angers the Lahui. And then we see this as a result, though, of the failure for people to sign up. Yeah? For a long time, they were stuck at 15,000 names. And they moved it on up with these kinds of things. People got scared. It's the truth. People got scared. And this motivated people to sign up. 
Um, but as um, Kaleko always said, when they did the Kuwait petitions was Pono. Hawaiians were coming out of the valleys to sign up. We contrast that here, nobody wanted to sign up. Something's wrong. As Brother Skippy would say, he go by smell. If it smells bad, go up with. And then, um, March 2014, OHA announces their nation building plan. Ho'ululamui. Many of us are again, for the third or fourth time, caught off guard. Had no idea this was coming down the pipe. And we see a big press release with community leaders in the picture. And then we find out that it was a very exclusive, invite-only press release with select leaders to promote this agenda and make it look good. Um, none of us had any idea that this was coming down the, the river. We find out that the uh, nation building plan was designed by OHA Ad Hoc Committee. Um, from what I understand, this Ad Hoc Committee was comprised of five OHA employees. No community. Anybody in this room was on the Ad Hoc Committee? Try raise your hand. Oh, nobody. Doesn't sound like self-determination to me. So no community involvement, yeah? No representation from the community on the design of our future. Yet, ironically, OHA repeatedly asserts commitment to neutrality, to neutrality, and to just, we're just here to facilitate, yeah? They even come out with a document, the Board of Trustees passes this document, votes for it, the OHA statement of commitment on governance. But, if you read this document, Nowhere does it say anything about neutrality. They were saying neutrality, but in the palapala, the thing that holds them accountable, there's no statement of neutrality. What it says is, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs commits itself by facilitating um, and supporting this nation-building process. Yeah? It says there in the the governance AHA would facilitate the opportunity for delegates to propose form scope and principles that would guide the governing entity. So what we find out through this so-called statement of commitment, their job is to facilitate, that's what they're saying. We're going to facilitate the nation building. Kind of sounded good until, I think this was on a Friday this came out. Yeah, by Wednesday. By Wednesday, OHA's in Washington, D.C., but not only OHA. We see members of Kanai Olobalu Role Commission. So they're in D.C. after committing to be neutral and then facilitate, and this is what they understand facilitating to be. We're going to go and we're going to set up the back end so that it's there, so that when the nation starts rolling out, it can roll right into federal recognition. This picture is kind of funny. We didn't really know that they were there until Maisie Hirono's office, they have their own Twitter account. They tweeted this picture, and we were like, ah, oh, those frickers, they stay in DC right now, who lied? But what's important to understand is we have OHA people, and we also have Kanai Olovalo people, and on the far right, we have a lady who's really been a mastermind, Norma Wong. She used to work for Waihe'e when he was governor. She's a political strategist. She's the one that strategized and brokered the $400 million that was used to clean up Kaho'olawe. So she has a lot of connections in D.C. So Kanaya Olovalo contracts her as a consultant for about $500,000. And Naya Olovalo hires her for half a million dollars to be their legal strategist. If their job is to build a role, just to build a role, they have no business in D.C. and they have no business hiring a political strategist. The job of building a role is right here in the community and we, as we all saw, the community wasn't having it. But we see another layer of improper behavior of violation to self-determination. 
So, great lack of response from the whole Hawaiian community. Very few people signing up. They're getting desperate. They're getting desperate. Millions of dollars have gone into this role and the numbers are very low. So, they plan Act 77. Act 77 allows them to pull names from older Hawaiian registries. Of course, Kaolinoa, the t-shirt list. I would argue, I'm comfortable saying this, most people got on Kaolinoa because they just wanted a free t-shirt. <laughs> uh, Office of Hawaiian Affairs has their uh, affairs has their Hawaiian registry, which has a database. So ancestry, ancestry verification. Oftentimes, the OHA registry was used for scholarships and grants, stuff like that. But they have their own database, and there's something else called Operation OHANA program. So Act 77 allows them to pull all these names into the dismal failure of the role and to buffer it with over a hundred thousand names. And I know for a fact that there was much debate within OHA and that some of the leaders, some of the leaders within OHA felt that this was improper. But they didn't, they, were, they weren't in control. In fact, I want to point out that OHA was kind of in control of some things, but not in control of other things. If you've been at um, some of the Kamawa Ea meetings that OHA held a couple years ago, CEO Kamanao Ponokrat has stated publicly multiple times that Kanai Olomalu mandated OHA to pay for Kanai Olomalu. They didn't have a choice. They had to, they had to fund Kanai Olomalu. And that doesn't sound like self-determination if the, uh, the state's telling the trustees what they must do with trust funds. So we see another layer violation here. Um, so Act 77 pulls all these names in. And there's some people who want to challenge it legally. Is there, is there a violation of confidentiality? Is there a violation of free prior for consent? Anything. And there's an analysis that comes out that, well, you can opt out, so you're not really being violated. You can opt out. Highest principles of self-determination should be to opt in, not opt out. Yeah. I think we can all agree on that. Shortly after, um, OHA has this idea that to bring credibility to this failing nation building process that nobody's signing up for, let's bring in the Hawaiian Royal Societies. Yeah, these old kingdom societies that have a long history going back to the kingdom with the idea that they'll bring some prestige to this process and that it might motivate people to trust and get involved. And right away, it blows up in their face. The Uncle seal right here, acknowledge him. Royal Order of Kamehameha rejects it, the consortium, and says, we don't want to be a part of this because we are for the restoration of our kingdom and our independence as a people. Royal, Royal Order, in a way, sets the tone. And after a lot of debate, hooky, 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 amongst the different societies, what ends up happening is not a single society steps forward to take this kuleana. Not the Kalahuman Society, not Lunalino, Homes Trust, none of them. They don't touch it. They don't want to commit their trust to taking the, the trust that they manage to enter into this kuleana. So they say no. What ends up happening is some of the leaders from these societies, individuals, individuals, step forward and say, basically, we'll do it. So really, Nani Apuni is the brainchild of OHA. In a way, it's the failed uh, brainchild of OHA to bring prestige and credibility to this process. And it just is left with, we thought it was four, we found out it was five. Some of you were there, I testified at an OHA meeting. I asked the trustees, who are these four people you're gonna give $2.8 million to? Who are they? Can you tell us who they are? Oh, I'm not even able to say who the names are. We give $2.8 million and at the board table they can't even tell us their names. So I really pissed them off when I tell them, you should give the money to me, Kalikoa, Skippy, and Dexter. They should know us. Everybody laugh. And yeah. So, um, what happened?
happens is these individuals emerge. Oha has to, at this point, Oha must go along with the plan. There's no really no other options. So they fund them $2.8 million, and what we're hearing now is they're going to give them another $500,000 if they haven't already. Um, and you know, one of the key things I think is really important is one of the members of this, Nail Puni, is the wife of former OHA executive, CEO, Clyde Namo, who is currently the executive director of Kanayel Puni. So this thing is, uh, sorry, not Kanayel Puni, Kalamai, Kanayel Ovalu. Clyde Namo leaves OHA, becomes the executive director of Kanayel Ovalu. Now his wife is involved in Nail Puni. So we have this kind of incestuous conflict. I remember approaching one of the trustees and I, I say, isn't that a problem? Don't you think there's a conflict of interest there? And the answer that I got was, well, Pauline's not like Clyde. She's much more responsible. <laughs> so, sorry we got a lot of text here, but basically, kind of want to wrap this up as I talked about, you know, throughout this whole genealogy of nation building, really going back to 2000 with the formation of Akaka Bill, we've never really had, we never, not we, they never strive for the highest principles of inclusion. Yeah? Self-determination is a core principle in inter international law that says that all peoples have the right to freely determine their political status, and it specifically includes independence. It cannot be initiated, controlled, or monitored by the occupying state. All people have the right to self-determination, to freely determine their political status, and pursue economic, social, cultural development. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 15, states that everyone has the right to a nationality, and no one should arbitrarily be deprived of that or denied the right to even change nationality. What's very interesting, as I close up, is if you look at the Department of Interior rules that just came out the other day, they affirm that the rules were made in accordance with the United States standards of self-determination. We got so we got multiple political definitions happening here. But this language comes from the UN drip, which is um, seen, I think, universally as some of the highest standards of self-determination coming from the international level. Collective indigenous peoples have put these, these standards together. What's interesting to me is that DOI is saying we're doing it in accordance with the United States standards of self-determination. Act 195 says, Act 195 references the UN trip, these higher principles. So we have uh, another layer, I think, of, of sort of disconnected conflict, yeah? Um, I called over to the Department of Interior last week and asked them, what are what are the U.S. Um, standards of self-determination? Where do they come from? And what I was told was, well, we don't really have anything specifically for Hawaiians, so we kind of got to draw from, from Indian law. So, to summarize, um, throughout this whole process, this genealogy of nation building and stuff, we can see clearly, there's no doubt in my mind, and I think, I believe, hopefully most of you or all of you agree, principles of self-determination have been violated and have not been met in the least. There's never been a neutral process. State recognition is going to happen even if federal recognition fails. And we see that there's an underlying agenda to settle Hawaiian claims over national lands. That claim that Antinani pointed out, we've never acquiesced our claim over national lands. It's about to happen this way if the sort of the backdoor, the backdoor dealings happen for a global settlement. Uh, federal recognition threatens international claims to independence. Um, when the DOI was here, Department of Justice Attorney in Nanakuli was here, I asked him, would federal recognition preclude independence? He said, I can't answer that. Um, I asked Professor Chang to look at Indian law, Indian law. U.S. Code 25, Section 371 basically says, no native tribes shall seek independence. The
Constitution, the United States Constitution is self-preserving, set up to never see territory back. So it could never be recognized as an independent um, country through US law. It's set up to prevent that. Um, what we believe is you have a corrupt process, you will end up with a corrupt outcome. Because of all of this history, many of us have chosen that participation is unprincipled, that we just can't muster up the willingness to participate in something that's so rotten. Yeah. I believe you cannot make a good meal if we study with rotten food. Um, we believe that participation, even by our, uh, by our independence friends and allies, they will not get in. They will not be able to control this thing. It's going to be set up to be controlled by the people who designed it, and that participation will only serve to validate and legitimize the outcome. Mahamud? Kau kuwana honoa opi ilani 